once I overcame it, I now enjoy sex. I actually try and assert that introverts actually have an advantage. So I think my driver was proving other people wrong. And I think that is the worst driver in the world. It's just the one that I had back then. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales Man podcast. On today's show, we have Matthew Pard. He is the author of The Introvert's Edge, how the quiet and shy can outsell anyone and introvertedness, sales, business and winning is exactly what we're talking about in today's episode you can find out more about matthew the book over at the introvert edge.com where you can get a free chapter and there's a video series there as well waiting for you and with all i said let's jump right in are introverts in the world of sales and business are they at this is the stereotype are they at a disadvantage versus the the charming charismatic silver-tongued extroverted salesperson Absolutely not. I I, th I think you'll notice from, from my book, which I really appreciate you endorsing, that I actually try and assert that introverts actually have an advantage if they know how to achieve that advantage. If they don't, then they have a severe disadvantage. Okay, so clearly we're going to dive into that. I want to dive into the the step-by-step -step process of uncovering the advantages, how to leverage them. And I know there's a lot of introverts who listen to the show who are going to take massive value from it. But I guess let's define what an introvert is because just before we click record, I feel like I've got some introverted traits, some extroverted traits. I know, well, we'll ask you in a second who, how you consider yourself in that mix, but how do you define an introvert? You know, it's, what's funny is I keep getting surprised to pe about the people that I find that are, that are introverted. I think us as, as introverts ourselves, we, we tend to project anytime somebody's successful on a podcast or on stage or in selling or networking, they go, that person must be an extrovert because it's just natural to them. And a lot of times it doesn't come naturally. You know, Jamie Masters, who I would consider one of the best show hosts uh, for podcasts, she's got the, you know, the eventual millionaire. She used to have this massive rash that used to show up on the side of her face when she used to interview people. So a lot of times while we project that because people are successful in presenting networking and sales, that they're extroverts, they're actually not. What I define i mean there's a lot of studies and i that are out there around what makes an introvert what makes an extrovert and then you've got these whole new topics around situ situational extroverts and ambiverts to me it's simple there are introverts and there are extroverts and it really comes down to where you draw your energy see a good example is jim cathcart great friend of mine just wrote a wonderful review of um of my book in top sales world magazine he spoke at small business festival a big conference that i run in, in Austin, Texas, just recently actually listed as the number three conference in America for small business. He was the closing keynote, but he'd been around the event all day. So had I. At the end of the event, I wanted to go home into a dark room, switch <laughs> on a TV and just chill out, do nothing else. He wanted to go down Rainy Street and experience the live music capital of the world. That's where the difference is. It doesn't mean that you can't speak from stage. It doesn't mean you won't mingle with people afterwards. But it's where you go, where you want to go afterwards. That makes the massive difference. Well, I think we can debate the live music capital of the world, me being from Liverpool, <laughs> and we'll, we'll have that as a conversation when we wrap up recording here. But so that's fascinating to me, and that's what I feel like. So today I've done four interviews for the show. It can be the same whether I've got four kind of major uh, sales calls to sell ad space on the show, or, and recently a company tried to kind of buy everything that we're doing and, and hire me and employ me on the and it's the same thing every time. I can jump on that phone. I get motivated, get excited. I can have a great phone call. And then I need to just sit, as you described, in a dark room with a wet flannel over my head and just relax for 10 minutes or, or read a book or watch YouTube, whatever it is. I need, it's almost like I need a moment away from other people just to recharge. So uh, it's one hand I'm on this show, waving my arms around like a lunatic. I probably look slightly extrovert. Hopefully I look charismatic and extroverted to a certain extent, but I totally feel this. And it goes from recording these shows to getting on sales calls to difficult conversations I have to have elsewhere. So I feel this as well. And how, how would you define yourself, Matthew? Would you consider yourself fully introverted? Yeah, totally. I mean, so just looking at the, my lifestyle outside when I do engagements like this, you know, I speak from stage a lot. I sell a lot. And I do interviews like this a lot, but that doesn't mean that that's my typical method. It's what I, it, it's what I know I need to do to be a successful business, and I have a great system for each one of these things. So quite frequently, when I speak from stage, when I network, and when I do interviews, people are like, "Come on, you're not really an introvert." That's not true. I just have a really good system, 
and a really great process and some really great stories that I leverage that I've prepared before. But because I've done hundreds of them now, I actually have the opportunity to be able to do the, these things well and they come across as extroverted behaviors. But for myself, when I go home, I want to just det- um, just relax. My fiance is a massive introvert and I love that because the last thing I want to do when I get home from one of these days is have my fiance say, let's go out. I've organized all these times we can go out to dinner. That would drive me nuts. And coming in today to do this interview, normally I would get on my computer and I'd do a bunch of emails. You know, th- this morning I was a little bit sluggish. I watched some YouTube videos. I had a late breakfast because I knew that I wanted to have my utmost energy for this. And then I've got a lunch planned afterwards where it's just me and the television and I'm going to sit and watch it. Then I've got an interview with the American Association of Inside Sales Professionals. Then I've got a break and then I'll get back to the busy work of my day. But I have to make sure that I have these periods where it's just quiet time for me, where I can charge up my energy. Otherwise, I'll be doing this. I'll be doing this interview, you know, half exhausted, and or you know, doing a presentation with my arm on the desk, hoping that the audience would just go away. So we have to learn to manage our energy, but that doesn't mean that we can't deliver, if not as highly as the extroverts, if not more highly. Okay, so I want to come on to managing energy. Any hacks, uh, tactics to whether we need to look introverted and whether it's a uh, fake it till you make it. I want to come on to that in a second, but you said something here at the top of the show that I want to come back to because if I don't, I'll totally forget it. And I can't read my home I'm writing because it's terrible. So I'm going to, as it's top of mind, I'm going to, I'm going to pitch it to you, Matthew. And that is use the phrase people use, people say they must be an introvert. And as you said that, and, and they project that onto others when they're on stage, whether it's a uh, super uh, successful salesperson on the phone, do people do this because it's an excuse? It's a it's a process. It's a way of not taking on the challenge of having these extroverted traits yourself. It just seemed to me, as you said that, it was oh they can do it, but I can't. Is that something that you find that's common with salespeople who are trying to perhaps pick up some of these traits? Totally. I mean, I still do it. So you know, I was I was out at a networking event. Jamie Masters and I are great friends. She lives local to Austin, and we went to the Wizard Academy for I think you um, you might know these people, uh, uh, the, the Eisenbergs. They just wrote a, a wonderful new uh, best selling book, and they've written a couple of New York Times bestsellers. And we were at this event, and Jamie and I went together. And a lot of these people were new people for me, but she'd met them already. But we then sat there, we, we went into the event and both of us went away separately and did our process. In the car on the way back, she says to me, she's like, you know, I'm really surprised because a lot of people that um, cling to me at, around those events because they want me to do all the introductions. And I said, no, for me, I have to go solo because otherwise I will cling and it's a horrible thing. So I make sure I go and do my own thing. I said, but it's easy for you because you're an extrovert. She's like, no, Matt, I'm an introvert. It keeps, it's something that I do myself. I see people that are presenting, Dan Walshmit. We were at the uh, the Selling Power 2.0 conference in Philadelphia. And I saw him, and he was charismatic. And I was like, one day I'm going to be that great from stage. And then we got talking a, a while back, and I, I got introduced to him about being on my the, the Introvert's Edge podcast. And I said, Dan, you know, I'd, I'd love to have you on. You know, I think that you're an amazing presenter. But it's only for introverts. I only will interview introverts because otherwise, I'm, I'm, you know, extroverts can't teach introverts because they don't understand the problems that we face. Just like extrovert, uh, extroverts will struggle to learn active listening from an introvert because it's one of our natural skills. And I said, so I, I just I can't have you on. And he's like, Matt, you know, I'm an introvert, right? And so it's something that I continually do, even though I wrote, I've written a book saying that introverts can make great salespeople. So I've learned now to never assume. I've learned to ask the question. And a lot of people, because this isn't some, this is relatively, even though the research has been going for years, this is for the modern day population, this is something that we're really just starting to talk about. You know, I think we've, we've had our hands full. I just recently interview, interviewed uh, one of the, the head researchers for Great Place to Work on my podcast. And, you know, they've had their hands full with, you know, making sure there's equality in the workplace for women and then people of different cultures. But really now they even agree that the introverted world is really the next frontier for a great place to work for all. It's finally something that we're bringing attention to. And because of that, a lot of people don't even know that they're introverted or extroverted. And because of that, there's this massive hole 
in their ability to learn. First, but extroverts will go to the effort of learning things. Introverts have this whole idea that they don't have the gift of the gab. So there's this wall that they just can't pass. And as soon as they realize that that wall doesn't exist, there's just a few systems and processes away, well, the, 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 the really the world's open to them in a way they've not seen possible before. So for someone who's confused listening to this now, they don't know whether they are introverted, extroverted. Um, you can fill me in on this. I know there's a, a term for having both of them or a mix of them. Is there a way, and I guess if there's data and research being done on this, is there a scientific way to uncover how introverted or extroverted an individual is? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if, if you've heard of the, the Quiet Revolution, but there's a website for the Quiet Revolution. If you type it in, they've got a great little survey that you can fill out. Uh, to find out whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. I mean, if you just type in Google, am I an introvert or an extrovert? That test is everywhere. You'll find it out pretty, pretty quickly. Um, Myers-Briggs is also a lot of corporate um, get their organizations to staff to do Myers-Briggs test, and that'll, that'll highlight it. There's another great website, which I absolutely love this survey. It's called 16personalities.com. And it will actually tell you whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, but it will also give you a lot of other detail that's based on Myers-Briggs as well. But for me, what I tend to find is when you do one of those tests, here's one of the hurdles for the test. It asks you, based on who you are right now, questions about whether or not you're an introvert or an extrovert. The problem with that is just like you you're not going to say, no, I, I shy away from sales activities. I shy away from doing podcast interviews. Because what happens, just like me, sales was a huge barrier. And we can talk about that in a second for me. But once I overcame it, I now enjoy sales. It doesn't mean that after a day of sales, I'm not exhausted, but I enjoy it. So if a question, if somebody asked me the question, do you enjoy sales? Do you enjoy networking? Do you enjoy presenting? I absolutely love it, which means I would come across closer to the extroverted scale. So I think that from a, from a self-analysis perspective, think about you and who you are as a person. Think about who you were earlier and who you are now. And just think about where you draw your energy. If you don't get it from doing sales activities, if you don't get it from being around a large group of friends, like an interview like this one-on-one, -on -one, that for a lot of introverts cannot actually affect them. For others, it affects them greatly. But if you're around a group of people, are you charged up because of that or are you drained and then need some time to yourself? That's, to me, the easiest qualifier to, to, to make the biggest difference in your life. I like that definition because it, it's empowering for introverts, right? It's, it's saying you can do whatever you want. You can do what all these uh, loud, arm-waving, crazy dudes and women who are extroverted are doing. But you just got to be strategic about it. And that's what I want to come on to next, Matthew. Um, I want to get into some real practical, even if there's competitive advantages that introverts have over extroverts in the selling environments. But as you said it then, how did you overcome, uh, in your words, the barrier of not just winning in sales, but actively enjoying it? How did you overcome that barrier as an introvert? And, and do, is it a framing exercise or is it just a, a process of being comfortable with it? I think one of the one of the things I'm known for saying is the adversities in life seed the success of our futures. And the reason why I say that is because for me, unless I experienced a huge adversity, I would have been quite happy to believe this myth that sales was just a skill that I just didn't have. But I was kind of thrown into having no other option but to believe it was a process. And that that really happened because, you know, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. I was horribly introverted. I had really no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And while I got into the, the top 20% of my state in high school, it really took every bit of energy I had. I was exhausted. And my parents and I knew that if I was going to go to university, I would have been a six month, maybe a year dropout because I was just exhausted unless I knew exactly why I was doing it, which in truth, in business, in everything you do, if you don't know exactly why you're doing it, you're always going to struggle to succeed. And I knew I was at that state. So I convinced my family that I was going to take a year off to find myself. And what I did is I took a job at a real estate agency. And while a lot of people would think that, you know, I was the guy out front selling, I was actually the guy in the back office with this look on my face saying, don't talk to me, I'm here to find myself. And after about, I think I'd been there for about three or four weeks, my boss comes up to me, he goes, Matt, I, I got some bad news for you. The company's shutting down and you're out of a job. I'd been there three weeks, but very similar to, no, sorry, very different to the way it is in the United States. 
and a lot of the the time in in London and in Europe as well. You know, we have our summer and our Christmas at the same time. So we take this huge chunk of time off. Like everybody goes away on the 20th of December and they don't come back to the 15th to 20th of January. So no one's hiring just before that. The only places that are happy to hire, of course, commission only sales, right? They don't care. You know, my, my manager used to have this saying, we throw mud up against the wall and see what sticks, which is a fun saying and, until you're the mud. So I got this job in commission only sales and after five days product training and not a single second of sales training, I got thrown on this street called Sydney Road. And this is a this is a place where there's thousands of doors of retail stores on each side. And I just went to I went to walk into the first one and then I had this solemn realization no one had taught me how to sell. I didn't know what to say. So I took a breath and I walked into the first door and I politely got told to leave. Then I got told to get a real job. Then I got sworn at. People can be lovely to door-to-door salespeople, especially at Christmas time when they're trying to close <laughs> down, right? So I then, it, door after door after door of rejection, I got to the 93rd door and finally I made my first sale. So I made about $70. And I remember I was ecstatic for about 45 seconds until, again, I had this realization, i got to do this again tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. For me, that wasn't okay. And while there are a huge number of books out there that could have helped me, it would have taken me a year to read those books, let alone to apply them. I mean, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader. But I, what I did do is I made the decision because there was no way I was going to tell my father, who broke his back 80 hours a week to support us, that, sorry, sales was too hard. I made the decision that sales needed to work for me. And for it to work, it had to be a systematic process, something that I could learn that would get rid of the uh, the variability in the process, something where I could just learn the steps and it would be successful. And what I did is I actually learned YouTube was just becoming, you know, it was well before the days of things like podcasts and all the amazing audio books that are out right now. YouTube was really just becoming popular. And I learned to sell on YouTube. And over a period of really six weeks, I went from you know, 72 doors, to, well, 93 doors to 72 to 48 to 20 to 12 to 7 to 3 to about six weeks later, my manager calls me in. He had this stunned look on his face. He just got the monthly report and it turned out I was the number one sales performer in the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. So for me, it came down to making the decision that it had to be a systematic process or my life for that year was going to suck and then really gravitating to YouTube to learn those strategies. I think where a lot of introverts get stuck is they have this, they, they believe this myth and maybe things aren't hard enough or they believe it so much that maybe it's because all their friends and family are telling them as well that they can't do this because it is something that everybody talks about. You're not a natural salesperson. You shouldn't do that, that they don't try. For me, as soon as I realized that it was a system, I realized we had an advantage because an extrovert's ability to sell is hugely based on their mood. They're feeling great today. You know, they're making great sales. That's why people say the best time to make a sale is after your last one. But then they have a fight with their husband, their wife, their their son. All of a sudden, their sales plummet, and sometimes for weeks to months at a time. An introvert, because it's based on a system, the variability disappears. They just go and run the system, they run the program, and it delivers predictable results. So while an extrovert may outsell an introvert from time to time, an introvert over the space of weeks or months will beat an extrovert hands down, as long as you come past that milestone of that it's, it ha- you have to have the gift of the gap. You absolutely can do this. I love this. So you're covering a lot of ground here. I want to just touch on myths Then we're going to go into your why, because you mentioned that and then went straight to process. And we're going to wrap up with process and competitive advantages. But the myth element of this is fascinating to me because I basically got talked into sales by everyone I knew because I was told that I had the gift of the gap. Um, Then I I, I was going to say ironically, but I guess it's not ironically. There's probably, you could have probably recorded this and done data on it. I've got two brothers. Uh, My middle brother is a pharmacist and he is quote unquote introvert, he will come in from a hard day's work in in the pharmacy and he'll sit and read a book out the way and just sit and recharge. We've known this since he was a kid. And when he was a kid, I was apparently a proper rip. I was running around. I was causing trouble. I was a pain in the ass. He, we called him the blob because he would just sit there, be no trouble, really nice kid to to be around. 
um, and just, you know, even babysitters, my aunties that look after him. He was known as essentially just sit there, he would smile and he'd have a nice little time. And I'm always intrigued as to whether, because I was the first child, I was treated differently to the second child. And there's the cliches of, I would get all new stuff. I'd be over cared for, overlooked after. And then once you've been through the first child, the second one gets all the hand-me-downs and then the third one gets all new stuff again because the second one's already broken all the stuff. And it's fascinating to me, um, the the myths, the stories that you're told as you're growing up of, oh, he's the quiet one. So is that pushing you? Is it clearly nature versus nurture? I don't know if there's a gene for um, introvertedness that probably seem there's a gene for most things. So maybe there's something to that. But it's always interesting to me. And I always assumed Phil was, even though he's a pharmacist, even though I knew he'd be chatting with patients every day, I've never really seen him in that environment. Um, at the Sales Innovation Expo last year, I brought him down to help out with some of the camera work um, as we did live interviews there. And he was chatting to everyone and it was amazing. And I've never seen him in that environment uh, as an adult anyway. Uh, he was going around chat to people. People were coming and trying to get interviews with me and, and chat with me. And he essentially fended them off. And I've never seen him like that. But again, at the end of the day, he turned it off and he wanted to just sit in his hotel room and just chill on his own. Whereas I was going out drinking and partying with people from the expo. It, it was, that was a fascinating kind of a uh, switch that I saw. So that, that, that myth elements just kind of aligned with me then. Cause I'm sure there's a bunch of middle children listening to this who, or just children that they were told when they were young, they were quiet. And so they probably lived some of that life that hopefully that is eye opening for them that they can, they can turn this on and off. And it's, it's perhaps effort that allows them to do it as opposed to, a kind of uh, any magical moment where your mom or dad tells you otherwise uh, that you weren't quiet as a child or anything like that. The other thing is the why. Other than kind of being skint and broke and going back to your dad and saying, oh, I didn't achieve it. What what was your why? Or, or, or was that your why for kind of pushing your, your the, the barriers out the way and, and breaking through and making that effort? What was your why for breaking past this, this point of, I'm an introvert, I can't do it, to, oh, I'll give it a shot. Yeah, definitely. So first, let's let's cover the first element. So you talked about, you know, you, you, your brother really, you know, quite quiet in the early years and then later on. What actually probably has happened? So there are studies that talk about different levels of sensitivity. So there's linkages between introversion and sensitivity. And what they what the research talks about is the fact that the more sensitive we are, the more introverted we could possibly be. So it could be that your brother was just more sensitive to ex outside stimulus. It's why it exhausts us, but it's also why we're more in tune to people, right? It's why introverts are perceived to have more empathy for people. It's because we're more sensitive to our exterior environment, and which, which means that we need very little stimulus to stimulate us highly, which is why introverts can tend to be in our head uh, so often. Let's, for me, what the why is so vitally important because originally i my why was i wanted to support myself a lot of people i mean i, I was the guy in school that i had horrible ac acne like i'll send you a photo and you can put this up as a 30 second slide on your video if you'd like but i prefer 10 just get it on and get it off i use it in my presentations and i'm like i'm gonna put that up i'm gonna change it straight away right but it was a photo at my sister's wedding and, you know, as a brother, you want to be, you want to put your best foot forward. You know, that's going to be on a mantle forever. And I had this red face, you know, horrible acne. I was uncomfortable, but I also had a reading speed issue. I got diagnosed with what's called Erlen syndrome. I had these big blue uh, gray glasses. You know, I, I was uncomfortable at everything. And I think my why was to prove that I was actually a smart kid and that I wasn't a waste of space because, you know, a lot of people, you know, at school were telling me I was never going to amount to anything. And the whole leaving and not going straight to university was kind of a, a proof of that. So I think my driver was proving other people wrong. And I think that is the worst driver in the world. It's just the one that I had back then. So one of the things that I find when people talk about their driving, their drivers is that people have this external, I'm going to prove that I'm worthwhile. Like when people start their own business, it's like the first thing is about proving that they're not crazy. Well, no, it's supposed to be an internal motivation, right? So what, 
when we talk about the whys, here's the thing that I experience. People tend to inherit their goals from their mother, their father, their drunk roommate they had in university, right? We hear these goals and we're like, yes, that's what I want too. And we spend the rest of our lives trying to obtain this. And we never really think it through. So a lot of times we get this lackluster amount of energy towards obtaining it or, you know, sometimes worse, we actually throw all of our energy at it. We hit it and we're like, why did I even bother? So I think the why or the driver is important. I mean, I've been responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories, but at the peak of every one of those, I never said that I was happy, right? One of the biggest drivers for me was realizing how important that why was. And, you know, I've learned, you know, one of the, the things I've got a reputation for is being the rapid growth guy. I can create rapid growth out of any business, but there's nothing worse than having a rapid growth business with customers you can't stand or doing something you don't enjoy doing. So for me, one of the things that I talk about, and while the, while the book has, you know, has got the, some great content in learning the sales process, what I've actually created is this entire video program that goes off the back end of this that actually gives people tasks to do, which is an implementation training. And the very first thing that we cover is writing three business goals, three career goals or personal goals, uh, sorry, three business or career goals and three personal goals. One, very personal to yourself and it's selfish to yourself because that's what's going to drive you. And then more importantly, that's really a means to an end. It's about writing why each one of those goals is important to you in 250 words or less. And the reason why I get people to do that is what I find is especially high achievers and a lot of salespeople can be that way is they'll write their goals really quickly and they go to write why they're important to them. And all of a sudden they realize they're struggling to come up with reasons and they've discovered that the whys, aren't, they, they're, they're not important to them. It's just something that they've inherited. And especially for a lot of introverts, the why has to be strong enough to deal with the amount of work that you have to do to overcome this barrier. One of the things that I look at is my ability to sell now is by far better than most people that I run into. And I put no work into it and deliver better results than everyone because I had to climb Mount Everest first. But now I'm always on the downhill slope. So I'm always doing so much better than most. For an introvert, your why has to be so strong to push yourself up there, to be willing to write down your stories, to script the process, to not sound like a robot once you've scripted it so that you, you, know, you read it like an actor, you embrace it so that you can deliver a, a, a script, a story, a, you know, a great questioning process off the cuff so it seems natural. It takes a lot of work at the beginning and your why has to be strong enough. But then after you've done that work, wow, you get to earn the income that most people wish they could earn for a lifetime because you've done that work at the start. And that's why the why is absolutely vital. And you know, I, while I cover it in um, the mentor program as part of the book, you can also go, I've got a podcast uh, called Better Business Coach. And episode 17 is called Forget About Goals, Why is the Key to Success? If you do that, especially as an introvert, I think you'll find that your focus will just shift and the energy, I, I, I call it almost tapping into your superpower, the energy you'll have to push through these barriers, they'll seem like nothing where at the moment they feel like these massively high walls. I'm, I'm nodding as we go along here, Matthew, like a, a, a bobblehead that's just been flicked ridiculously. Because So three things as I'm going through this. One, um, Helen Erlen, I've actually interviewed her. Um, I don't suffer from Erlen syndrome, but I know people who do, and I'll link it, link it in the show notes. If you have trouble reading, if you feel like other people around you read faster than what you can, it's well worth investigating. And a simple piece of colored plastic over the book, over the content, over your screen can make a huge difference to your ability to just see information on a screen and absorb it. And it, I know it's made a big difference to a couple of people in my life. So I'll link to that. So that's one thing. Two, I had terrible acne. I was on Miracutane as a kid. I feel the pain, mate. I feel um, I feel uh, the kind of uh, the stories that you're telling there. Um, and then the third thing is, this is a realization that I've had quite recently. So I've got this GTR, Nissan GTR on the table. It's a regular story of the podcast that um, I could probably buy one right now. It'd be the most ridiculous financial decision I could possibly make with the kind of cash flow and the, the fact that I'm trying to invest everything back into the business and grow it. But it's it's going to be it's going to happen at some point. It's going to be a story in itself of that is the moment that everything's kind of come up, come together, aligned, and I can afford to waste eighty grand on a ridiculous car. That it's just it's just a total stupid financial decision. But this was a big driver for me until the past few weeks. 
And I did the exercise, which is what you're describing there inadvertently of, I want a GTR. I'm going to work my ass off. I'm going to put out all this content. I'm going to really help salespeople. I'm going to build a real community, which is what we've done with Sales Nation. Everyone listening to this. And then ask the question, why? And the reason, I, I, other than it looks cool, I, it'll make me feel like a better person than just driving around with a Nissan Micra. I was, I, I become really deflated by it. And it, it, it was unfortunate because it was really motivating for a period of time, then immediately was unmotivating and wasn't the, the focus of, of mine. And then I kind of shifted the whole, everything that we're doing with the sales of podcast and people who haven't been on the website in a while, if you go to salesman.org, you'll start to see this. I've shifted everything to sales is essentially a skill I truly believe is really important for not just business professionals to have. It's important for everyone to have just in life in general. So we're building the website out now and the content starts to align with it. And this show is perfect for that of everyone should have the knowledge to sell. And so that's what the goal is now, just to build a, a totally free resource, no courses, no products. We're going to offer coaching on the side of it for anyone who wants to up the game and do it quicker. But if you can study, you can be able to go on the website and just absorb the information, put into practice, and anyone can learn to sell. Um, you know, books are great. Um, online videos are great. But this is just going to be one kind of set process of how I and the team here believe that B2B sales should be done in kind of 2018 as we record this. And that then is way more motivating than a GTR. And it's, I don't know whether this is intrinsic, extrinsic. I don't know if it's a selfish thing of, I want to be able to go places and people go, well done and give me a pat on the back because they had success. I don't know whether that's an element of it. I'm not sure what it is, but it was inspiring to, to hear you talk about people's whys and then the why behind the why, which is the, the real reason, because this is something I've gone through recently. Anyway, all that aside <laughs> for one second, because I want to wrap the show up here, Matthew, with some real practical advice. So I want to cherry pick a few things here. What do introverts have a competitive advantage over extroverts? Um, what's the one or two things? You mentioned active listening. Um, you mentioned empathy. So what what the one or two biggest bang for book um, competitive advantages that introverts have over extroverts. And then I want to dive into how we can leverage these practically and how the audience could leverage them to, yeah, to kick the competition's ass. Yeah, sure. So I think you, you, you covered the two major ones, which is, you know, active listening and empathy. But the other one, which is huge, is introverts love to prepare. Extroverts like to run off the cuff and just do things as it happens introverts love to say, well, hang on a second, let's 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 think about this. I'm about to go into this meeting. The, I think with sales and networking, the problem they have is they don't know that they can prepare. And I think armed with the knowledge that they can, every introvert that I've ever worked with act, happily prepares. What's funny is I've actually taught these skills from the book to extroverts, and I'm talking coffee, you know, hammered, hammering down coffee, fists on the on the table, yelling at the phone kind of salespeople. And the system works just as well. You know, I've had to break them down and say, mate, this is a horrible way to live. I know you <laughs> can do this, but why would you, right, when you can do it this way? But what happens is they keep wanting to go back to their extroverted personality, while an introvert, when they get a system, holds on to it for dear life because that is their saving grace. So here's the thing. As an introvert, we are more we, we have higher empathy, which means when and we and we listen better. So when we ask great questions, and in the book I talk about the fact that we need to ask great questions and not just any questions, but strategic questions that lead to our specific product. That is highly important. But then we listen to the answers, which is so important, as opposed to an extrovert that a lot of times is thinking about what to say next. So we empathize, we listen, we internalize, but then here's the problem that introverts have. We internalize so much, we're so much in our head, we're, we're quiet during that time, and the customers then divulge their heart, and we've really taken it on, and we take too long to respond. And then we start getting into the nitty gritty details about how to fix their problem, and the customer's like, oh my God, that's so much effort, and we lose the sale. Because of our ability to prepare, introverts can actually prepare stories. And this is huge. See, an, intro, an introvert with this, armed with a story can become a great storyteller. Now, if introverts out there think they're not great at stories, think about the story about how you met your husband or wife. When you first told that story, it was probably bulky. There were parts that were boring, that people glazed over. There were parts that were exciting. And over time, you've learned to remove the boring parts 
and embellish a little bit more on the things that are exciting to the point now it's probably a theatrical masterpiece when anyone asks you 10 years later, right? So we get great at telling stories if we're practiced at them. So why would sales be any different? So what I always suggest for introverts is that our ability to tell sports stories is you know, sensational because we can empathize, we can get into the, the nitty gritty detail, but it also keeps us above the, the, the real deep detail that gets us bogged down. Stories also have a couple of other real key factors. One is, for an introvert especially, it creates a natural resonance between the teller and the listener. This is a study out of Princeton. So it creates this artificial rapport. So when I get on stage, you know, I've got a speaking event coming up um, shortly where I'm speaking at Microsoft Inspire, 18,000 people. And I know as an introvert, if I try and say something off the cuff that's funny, that ain't going to work out so well. So what I do is I have this practice. Wow, what a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much for such, uh, such a great introduction. How will I live up to it? I know. I'll tell you about Wendy. And I start telling a story. Now, as soon as I start telling that story, I know I'm creating that artificial rapport. I mean, this is, goes back to the Middle Ages when people would waltz into town and share stories. There's a couple of other factors with stories. The next one is it's proven that people remember 22 times more information when embedded into a story. Here's the advantage there. I know if a load of salespeople go in, let's imagine I'm one of 10, and those other 10 people go in and sell the sizzle, not the steak. They go in and relate the, the features of the product to the benefit, and they tell a customer, which salespeople are great at doing, especially extroverts. They're great at telling. And I know I just go in and tell a well-articulated story of a customer just like them that had a similar problem, how the implementation that we had and the outcome, both from a savings of money or a ROI, a saving of opportunity cost and a saving of stress. I know that customer is going to listen to that and they're going to internalize a lot more of it and remember a lot more of the detail. Now, that means if I go up against 10 salespeople, if I say the same amount of information that they did embedded in this story, they're likely to remember more of what I told them than the other nine people. Also, they're more likely to remember the order. Everybody knows, um, if, if I was to tell you, well, to, to remember, you know, beds, porridge, and chairs, and I'm gonna, I say, come back a year from now and tell me what those items are. No way you're going to remember them. But if I asked you to tell me the story of the, the childhood story, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, not only would you tell me that she ate some porridge, she broke some chairs, and she slept in a bed, You'd, also, you'd be able to tell me the order that it happened. So people just remember this stuff. And then there's one last key, and this is, this is huge. What happens is when an extrovert or an introvert tells somebody how they think they can help someone? The logical mind listens. And what it does is it's not only thinking, do I have time for this? It's also, especially in cold calling, it also thinks, does that apply to me? Would that work for me? The logical mind is swatting things away as fast as you're giving it to them. When you tell it as a story, it actually short circuits the logical mind. There's a lot of studies that talk about the fact that we had three minds, our survival mind, our emotional mind, and our logical mind. You know, the, the survival mind is what kicks in when we see a bear and we run away. The emotional mind kicks in the next day when it bursts out crying. And our logical mind is what kicks in about a week later when it, it's looking at the situation going, I could have kicked that bear's ass, <laughs> right? So this is what happens when we tell a story. What it does is it actually short circuits the logical mind and you're speaking directly to the emotional mind. The emo emotional mind has no idea how to tell the difference between fact and fiction. And you can't disagree with this person's story because it's a story of a real customer. All it does is listen to the story and interpret the moral of that story and decide whether or not that moral of the story applies to them. So if it's somebody that's given you an objection and you say, and this is what's called an objection handling cushion, I perfectly understand the last thing I want to do is waste any of your time. However, don't say the word but, that's a subtraction term and it basically means I didn't disregard everything I said, now I'm going to tell you what I really think. Don't believe me? Go and tell your wife, you look perfect, beautiful in that dress, dear, but and see how that goes. Use the word however as an additional term. However, I actually had a customer just like you about a year ago that had a similar objection. Here's what we did. Here was the outcome. And now they're so happy that they worked with us. The moral of the story is not that I'm disagreeing with them. I'm telling them a story of someone else. So they go, oh, okay, I see how that applies to me. Continue on. 
And the other real cool factor is while somebody with a logical mind would probably listen to something for eight seconds before going, yeah, yeah, that doesn't apply for me. We've clocked it at like two and a half minutes with high level C level executives when middle managers will hang up at eight seconds. They just listen to the entire story until it finishes, resonate with the moral and continue on. So for introverts, their ability to prepare means they can create not these long, ridiculous stories, but these concise, well articulated stories in advance and then just look for opportunities to leverage those stories throughout the conversation. Love it. I love it. You you used, um, I think you used it anecdotally, ad, uh, preparation in advance of meetings, in advance of calls, in advance of uh, you keep speaking right at the top of the show. So I'm glad you brought it back around to that. And I've got one final question on this. Um, give me a yes, no answer, because it's another four hour conversation, I'm sure. <laughs> Is there a different process to selling to an introvert versus selling to an extrovert? In truth, there shouldn't be. However, what, what happens is if you don't have a very, if you have a variable process, a lot of times it leads to a variable outcome. So in that choice, if you don't have a sales system, yes, there is a different process. However, there's a study um, from out of the BNI groups, the skill sets that are the most appreciated in sales are actually from both extroverts and extra, in introverts. So the answer is no, there isn't. However, because of the way most people are doing it, absolutely. Interesting. I, I was not expecting that. So thank you for that, Matthew. With that, mate, we've touched on the book, but tell us where we can find a free chapter and then uh, the video content that comes along with it as well. Yeah, definitely. So the free chapter you can download at theintrovertsedge.com. And for me, while a lot of free chapters kind of have a load of fluff in it, trying to excite you about the book, for me, I'm, I'm really on a mission to make introverts believe that they don't have to have this gift of the gab. So that's why, you know, I founded National Introverts Week here in America to try and bring attention to that. So for me, the, the, the first chapter is no different. It includes the full seven step process. And if you do nothing more than download the chapter, read it, grab those seven steps, look at what you're currently saying to a customer, put it into those steps. If it doesn't fit, throw it out. Don't try and figure out how to fit what you say in. See that there'll be some gaps. One of the biggest gaps will be questioning and stories. Fill those gaps in and then apply that, learn it, embrace it, and tell and use it with customers. You'll double your sales in the next 60 days. And you don't need to buy the book for that. Just go to theintrovertsedge.com and download the first chapter. The implementation training is really more for me is I didn't want to not hold your hand through the entire journey. I know the, the reason why the book is written like a novel and has all these stories in it is and so it's entertaining because as an introvert, I get that it's confronting to try and learn how to sell. So I wanted it to be enjoyable. And the implementation training is for the same reason. I want people, you when, when people purchase the book, they can click on the introvertsedge.com forward slash inside circle and they'll actually be able to join a an online training that'll actually teach them how to implement it into their own business or their own career. And there's also a Facebook group where if they've got questions, they can ask me directly. Amazing stuff. Well, I'll link to all that in the show notes of this episode, including uh, Erlin syndrome and everything else that we're talking about. We've covered a lot of ground in this one, mate. Um, I'll link to it all over at salesman.org. And with that, Matthew, thank you for your time, mate. Thank you for, because this is, this is, and take this from me, a very unique perspective on kind of the, the B2B sales world. So I appreciate what you're doing. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, love you and leave you and uh, let you go and have a chill, relax, recuperate before your next call, mate. Thanks for joining us on the show. Absolutely appreciate it, Will. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>